Welcome to the Real Wealth Solutions Podcast, everybody. I am one of your hosts, Greg Scully. Uh, joining me today, co-hosting role is uh, my business partner and spouse, Kim Scully, also known as Greg Scully on Zoom. And our guest today is a fellow East Tennessee investor, um, realtor, flipper, short-term rental owner, and full-time W-2 guy, uh, Derek. And is it Tellier, which I forgot to ask before we started yeah, recording? Yeah, you got it. All right, I nailed it. Um, yeah, Derek, uh, you know, we've kind of run the same circles and enjoy each other's company at, a, at the meetup every now and then, catch up online occasionally. You're down in uh, Marville? Murrillville, as they Murrillville. call it down here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, we're the, new to the Tennessee. The human race calls it Maryville, M-A-R. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's Murrillville, it's your local. So I'm still trying to figure out how to pronounce everything down here, but uh, Murrillville. Murrillville. And... Uh, and you're still W two in it as well, very much so, full time. Yeah. So so yeah, I mean, we got your bio here. We'll drop it into the into the notes so everybody can catch up you know, on social media. But yeah, give us give us a quick one round on, you know, the past few years, which is basically where where all of this has 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 happened. Uh, or correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. No. No. You're, you're well. It's you know I the the longest part of my real estate journey story actually, believe it or not starts in 1979 when I didn't realize it, but uh, my parents bought a five family house. Uh, I'm from Rhode Island originally, and uh, they bought this little five family house and uh, we lived on the first floor. So my parents were landlords from the time I was, you know, eight, seven, eight years old uh, until I was approaching high school. And then we bought a little single family house and moved out. And I had kind of like forgotten about that until actually I started getting into real estate. And then I was like, holy, wow, I was like exposed to real estate when I was six and I forgot. So uh, I don't really count that, but I guess technically it goes all the way back to there. But um, no, just in the last few years, um, really it was probably 2017 and uh, some friends of mine who had a couple of cabins in the Smokies and were into some real estate and I'd go and hang out with them and they kept telling me about, you know, the benefits of real estate and you know, here I was working, they'd come into town and say, come hang out and let's go do this. Let's go do that. And I was like, man, I got to work. He's like, you need to get out of that job. And I'm like, I can't just get out of the job. I was very limited in my beliefs on what, uh, you know, what you could do. I just grew up, both my parents worked W2 jobs. I grew up in that environment, very middle-class, you know, blue collar life growing up. But, uh, he kept bugging me and bugging me. And, uh, I went on a trip with a friend of mine and uh, it was on that trip on that weekend. We were just riding our motorcycles around East Tennessee and uh, South Carolina, North Carolina, Kentucky, Virginia. We hit five states in three days. And I was kind of like, man, I want to be able to do this more. I want, I want this kind of freedom. So I called up my friend and I said, okay, I, I need a mind shift. I said, you know, what do I need to do? And uh, keep in mind, I come from W2. You, you make money, you spend the money, you make more money, you spend more money. So I had no savings. I had no rainy day fund. I had nothing. And I was cheap, to, to be blunt. And uh, he says, uh, you need to read this book. And I'm like, man, I'm, I, my mind, I can't sit down and just read. He said, no, no, no. I mean, listen to the aud audio book. And I was like, well, how do you do that? And he said, well, you download this app called Audible. And I'm like, doesn't that cost money? I'm like, I didn't get it. So he starts beating me up. So I download Audible. And, uh, and he tells me I need to listen to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Of course, the gateway into all things, you know, mindset, real estate. Oh, really? Assets. I'll write that down. I've never heard of that. What's it called? Never heard of that one. It's a brand new one. <laughs> so um, I listened to that book and it was, uh, you know, you guys will remember, I don't know what the average age of your audience is, but in the 80s, they had the V8 commercials, you know, the old, I should have had a V8 kind of thing. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. That was my reaction as I'm listening to this audio. So that was my first shift and I still didn't totally get it, but I got the concept and, and listening to that one book turned into a solid um, 18 months of education, of networking. I went all in. I changed every aspect of everything in my life. Every leisure moment became listening to podcasts. I listened to every single episode, starting with one of Bigger Pockets podcast, which led me to other podcasts, audio books. Um, didn't do a lot of YouTube because I'm just, I wasn't, I can't sit still. I was listening to audiobooks while I was doing other stuff. Um, 
yeah, I just absorbed content nonstop. Uh, if I was driving, I was listening to audiobooks. If I was at the gym, if I was out running, I was listening to audiobooks. Um, I went from being listening to rock and roll music every moment of my life to nothing. It was real estate. Um, but, you know, I, I just I decided to get serious. I had some uh, other things going on in my life that, you know, like I said, I had no money. Uh, I had a daughter in high school. I had other obligations. So I just decided to, to educate myself. And, and I think that was a positive thing because sometimes I see people jump in a little too quick um, without education. You know, I'm on, I'm on forums and Facebook pages and I'm seeing people post questions that I'm like, have you listened to anything? Have you read a book one? So it was good for me to be forced into that education. Um, anyway, to, to fast forward a little bit, I was I had uh, gotten connected a little bit with Jake and Gino through the, through the podcast. I had reached out to them and uh, Gino was like on the phone with me and Josh both were on the phone with me. They were really, you know, just down to earth guys. And, uh, you know, one of the things that Gino suggested to me, he said, it, you know, why don't you get your real estate license? You know, he said you could do that part time and it'll get you just in real estate more. So a couple other people had suggested that. So. October of 18, I got my real estate license, started working with a local broker uh, part-time. Um, it really, it wasn't me. I'm a jeans and t-shirt kind of guy. And this was a brokerage that was very, you know, they were looking for full-time agents. I wasn't ready to be a full-time agent. This was just something I was doing on the side. Um, but I got in there and then, you know, things started to fall into place. Um, in April of 2018, no, 2019, April of 2019, um, I had gotten some things that I was going through personally kind of out of the way. I had been through education. I had lined up a private lender. I had, I had started networking um, to backtrack a little bit. October of 18, I started a meetup in East Tennessee. Um, I've had it going since October of 18 nonstop now. Um, so I had started to build some relationships and some, you know, a bigger network. So I'm an agent. I'm looking at the MLS every single night. Um, I had some things. I had some legal stuff I had to get taken care of. That all stuff got signed off on, on April 26th of 2019. On April 28th, 2019, a property literally two-tenths of a mile from where I work full-time comes up on the MLS. It's in the city of Maryville at $96,000, which is just, you don't see that around here. I went to go see the property the next day. I put an offer in cash with basically just a small contingency on inspection. I got the, I got the contract on it the second day. I got it under contract for um, 90, even though I had the fewest contingencies, they put me under contract for 90. I went in and did some inspections. I ended up getting them down to 75,000 um, after inspections. My private lender funded the purchase and uh, my initial rehab budget, which was about $40,000. I ended up spending about $63,000 on the rehab budget. And uh, yeah, in, there. in the in the end, so my final numbers in the end, it took me about six months to get it done. But by the end of it, I was about 145, 147, somewhere in that range in it. It appraised at 190. I got 75% uh, back out on a refi, got basically all of his money back, all of my money back, and uh, rented it out for $1,800 a month. So, oh, okay. So you more or less. Oh, yeah. Really I have infinite returns on that. Now. It was, uh, it was basically the home run, and I tell everybody it's like my first deal was a home run. So I'm expecting, you know, uh, my next several to be absolute. Yeah, that can be crashes. dangerous, you know, because yeah. you you think like, oh, this is easy because you had some great success, but. Right. Uh, but I was very, uh, very humbled by the whole thing. I knew this was not going to be normal. So it was a, it was a true burr from beginning to end. Um. But yeah, from there, it just started to steamroll. So I uh, picked up another property that I'm actually flipping. I moved into a new primary residence, turned my old primary residence into a rental, and then um, bought a short-term rental this uh, just back in May. So, so I'm sitting on five properties right now. One of them is a flip that I'm about to sell, though. So I'm looking actively for, for more. Where did, the, where did all the the five properties come from were they off the mls or, or so, was that you know the fruit you picked from the networking at the meetup type stuff how did that work out all, all of the above the, the first one came off the mls that was that first true investment property and again did that as a burr cash out refi the the 
technically the second property I purchased was the prim my primary residence that I'm living in now, which is a, I, I downsized, I uh, went to a really small house. And uh, so when I did that, I turned my former primary residence, which was a 2,600 square foot, three bedroom, big house, view of the Foothills Parkway. Uh, I turned that into a rental. So that created my two rentals, now my primary. And then the flip I found through a wholesaler, which came through my meetup. Um, and then the short-term rental came off of the MLS. Oh, right on. So, I mean, that was a lot and it happened fairly quickly. I want to just go back to like the book thing, you know, was that, was that a progression of steps and then the book was the tipping point or was the you know, was Rich Dad Poor Dad that early and immediately set you off? There was a lot of stuff going on in life in general. I was um, going back a couple of years before that. I just had, I don't know if you can call it a midlife crisis or whatever. I just, I just decided I was going in circles and I just wasn't happy with where my life was. I wasn't happy with the job. I wasn't happy with what I saw myself do. And I couldn't see myself working another 20 years doing what I was doing. Um, I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't healthy. I wasn't doing well. So I just decided initially to get healthy. And, you know, anybody who, especially as I get into these books and these podcasts and everything else you hear, this is a very common theme, but if your mind is, your mind gets a whole lot more clear when your body is feeling better. So it started really with that. I started just getting into shape. I started exercising. I started eating better. I started exercising. Um, I ended up becoming a runner, which was something I never thought I would ever do. Um, I was in my 40s, and all of a sudden, I'm on a treadmill, and then I'm on trails. And next thing you know, I'm running half marathons and um, ran a marathon. And I was just like, I mean, it was, it was ridiculous. I mean, here I was in my mid-40s and in better shape than I was when I was in my 20s. But it's amazing when, you're, when your body feels good, how clear your mind gets. So that kind of projected getting my, my mindset clear. And then I started listening to a, that rich dad, poor dad really helped push me over the edge. Um, but then a lot of the books I've read and listened to since then, I, I've really, the ones that have really helped me have been more about mindset. Um, you know, the educational stuff of the real estate is good for what I'm doing to get there, but the mindset is what gives you the ability to actually feel confident to do it. Yeah. Cause like, uh, you know, the mindset thing works for whatever you're pursuing. You know, if you want to be a better athlete, you want to be a better business person, a better parent, you know, whatever, it, it, all of that applies to any number of, of goals that you might have. And uh, like, just going back to the running thing, I know on Saturdays, it seems like that has maybe become a bit of a therapeutic thing for you as well, because you post very consistently on Saturdays to Facebook following a run. So there you're all, you know, all sweating it up and everything. And, you know, I, I do that a little bit myself with hikes. You know, that's where I tend to, you know, just shut things down and just enjoy some clarity of mind and just, you know, look around at other things and spreadsheets for a while. So, I mean, it's just very interesting because I would think that was also a comfort zone thing. A, a lot of people have trouble just posting to, to social media in general and worrying about, the impression they're going to make and here you are, you know, right after, I don't know how far you run, but you know, you're usually still breathing heavy and then you, you do two or three minutes of some really good mindset stuff. I just watched one this yeah. morning. I'm like, I'm like, Oh, I should probably start the morning with these as much as I do with the meditation. Cause they're, they're very, uh, uh, you know, they're very thoughtful. So, well, and, and it was, it was that is, is again, as you start to educate, you start, Ideas that are very commonplace to so many people for me were so new, but it was, you know, get outside of your comfort zone. You know, that's where success lies. And uh, I'm an introvert. I mean, people who see me out at the meetups and stuff, you know, don't, don't realize that, but I am an absolute introvert. And my, in my W2 job over, over the course of years, I kind of developed into more of a leadership role and I had to get up in front of a couple hundred people and talk. And I, you know, I, I would always get nervous doing it and eventually you get more comfortable doing it. But when I started, when I, even when I first started getting my real estate license, I started doing some of those videos and uh, I started doing some videos here and there after some runs and I wasn't doing them live back then. I was recording them so I could stop it and edit it because I, you know, I was going to screw up and this and that. And, and I finally, it was, again, other people just kept pushing me. It's like, get outside of your comfort zone. And I, I started doing live ones and I realized 
you know, when you're put on the spot, when you just do it, I mean, who cares if you screw up? No one's watching anyway. I mean, I say that in my videos. I'm like, if there's three or four people watching, I appreciate it. I don't know why you're bothering to watch me. I do them for me. Um, you know, and if I, if it happens to inspire somebody else, if they happen to see it or come across it and it helps them, then, then bonus. That's what I'm, I'm out there. I want to help people. I want to try to get people going down the right path. But it, as much as anything, I do those things to get myself comfortable and convince myself. I journal every morning and uh, I still struggle every single day with my mindset and, and getting my head right. And am I going down the right path and what am I doing? I mean, I'm still to this day, I'm still scared of there's so much fear and I still got my W2 job. And I mean, I'm working full time as a real estate agent as well. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I only just now started getting really serious with that. But I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to make as much money, if not more money in real estate as I will at my W-2. I don't, I'm at that point where I don't know that I technically need the W-2 job from a financial standpoint, but it, mentally I still feel, I still you need You feel it. very safe there. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm working hard to overcome that mm -hmm. um, because I'm, I'm ready to, to move on. I mean, I, like I said, I'm working 18 hour days right now, nonstop. And I still don't feel like I'm productive enough because I don't feel like I'm putting enough into any one thing. I'm spreading myself too thin. Well, we talked yeah. about that a little bit before we came on camera, trying to stay focused in what, what you're doing. And I appreciate when you do your live videos that you are talking to that one or two pr people that you think may be watching and that you do it for yourself. I think that is, that's what makes them work so well. You're not out there trying to do anything more than put yourself out there and say, this is what I'm doing and this is what I think. I think they're great. Appreciate it. Yeah, and also at the subconscious level, you know, you're putting it into the auditory, auditory dimension. So you're saying it out loud and naming it, and then you're also hearing it again because you're speaking out loud so you're 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 thinking it speaking out loud hearing it and that's just a reinforcement loop that i think helps people change mindset is uh same with the journaling because you're putting your thoughts you're you know you're transmitting them to paper and having a physical dimension to it and you're reading it so i don't know if i'm going too foo foo i don't care no. if i am or not I but so. i think there's something yeah. to that for sure no you're, you're dead on with it i mean like i mean Obviously, you know, I'm writing in this journal. No one's ever going to read that. I mean, that's 100% for me. The videos, I hope that I'm inspiring some other people as well. But again, it's, 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 it's to help myself get my own mind straight. And I mean, you know, you, you can listen to tons of books and they'll talk about it. You know, they'll talk about doing this and how much it makes sense. And most people just blow it off. And I mean, I still sometimes I struggle with writing it down because I don't, I don't know if I want to make it real. You know, but that it is, yeah. it, it, it's, there's a very strong mental, uh, mental attachment there when you write it down, when you speak it out loud, especially when you put it on video. Um, actually when I started my meetup, it was, it was kind of came from that. There was somebody else that had started a meetup using bigger pockets as their medium to kind of get it out there, um, back in middle of 18. And I went to a couple of their meetups. I want to say it was like July and August. And then in the August one, I mentioned to somebody else that was there who I happened to know. And I said, you know, if they don't keep this thing going, then I'll, 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 I'll pick up the baton and I'll, and I'll start the bigger pockets meetup over in this area. Well, September came around and they didn't do one. And I reached out to them and I didn't hear back from them. So I was like, well, crap, now I got to start a meetup. Cause I told one person that I would do right, it. Right. You created sure. an accountability. <laughs> Whether that person go. would ever come or not, it didn't matter. I had that in my head. So I did. I mean, I just, I posted it on just on bigger pockets was the only place I posted it the first time I held it at the hard rock cafe in Sevierville, which sounded really cool, but to have a, a networking meeting <laughs> is not the ideal place. They don't really? have a meeting room. Some they, distraction. They just, they just, and I, and I said, I don't know, set up a table for like eight to 10 people. And, uh, I showed up and I'm sitting at the bar waiting and then uh, a couple people showed up and I'm like, cause I, I mean, I was like 630 and I'm like, no one's going to come. I'm like, got my head down the bar. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm an idiot. And then a couple people started to show up and we, they went and sat us at our table and then more people started to show up and then more people started to show up. Next thing I know, I had 18 people. We had taken over half of the dining room in this particular area. And uh, I was like, wow, you know, this is, and it, that was just bigger pockets. 
And, uh, and you guys know Abraham Anderson. Mm -hmm. yep. He came to that very first one. And right up until COVID, he was the only person that hit every single one of my meetups. And then COVID hit. And I had to do a couple online. And then I just started him up again last month. And uh, I haven't seen him. But I know he's busy. Buying yeah, you do. Mobile home park in East Tennessee. So, oh, so yeah, right. I know. Exactly. You do your meetups a little bit differently, which I think are super interesting. Can you talk about why you do them the way you do and why they move? Which well, I well, think is part of that was um, again to be different, um, to try to create some consistent inconsistency. I guess uh, one, just searching for the right venue each time, but two, knowing that in well, this is a very rural area. So it's not like, you know, in a big city, you can host five meetups within five blocks of each other and there's millions of people. So there's plenty of different audience to come. You know, you have the Knoxville Real Estate Investors Association, you have a couple other meetups and they were all meeting in Knoxville. Nobody was meeting anywhere else. Well, I was always big on the short-term rental market. So I always thought doing something over in Sevier County around the Smoky Mountains was a good idea. Um, I live in Merville south of Knoxville. So I, I, there's people down here that don't want to necessarily travel to Knoxville. So what I decided to do was I rotate it. Um, I got, I was real inconsistent at first on the day of the week. Everybody hosts on Tuesdays. There was, I was literally running out of Tuesdays in the month. There just wasn't enough Tuesdays for me to host the meetup. Um, I realized I was competing against another meetup, which just didn't make sense to me. So I moved it to Thursdays. I made it the last Thursday of the month. And I started rotating it between Sevier County, Knox County, and Blunt County, which is where Maryville is. Um, and that was just really, it was about, I have a few people that consistently try to come to all of them. But when I move it to each county, I get different people that can only come to one or the other. When I do it in, in Sevier County, I do it um, in Kodak, right on Interstate 4, right off of Interstate 40 at the Chop House. Um, right at exit 407. So I get people that come down from Johnson City, from Jefferson City, because it's not quite as far for them, Kingsport. Um, I mean, Darren's been down to several of mine. It's Heath Ryan's, who you guys work with, came down to, to one of mine. Um, I've got a lender that lives out in Johnson City that only comes to that one. When I host in Maryville, I get people from uh, Loudoun County and, and Lenore City and south of here that'll come up. And of course, when I host in Knoxville, I get a little bit of everything. So I, I get exposure to more people by moving it around. I have a bigger audience, not all in the same, not every month, but in total, I have a much bigger audience. I mean, I've got roughly around 300 and something people that I send out a newsletter to once or twice a month, oh, you wow. know, that came from networking through the meetups. Now, not all of those people came to my meetup. I got them from other sources, but I've got, you know, several hundred people that I'm connecting with every few months. And I think what's interesting about your meetups too is that they're they're a real reflection of what we've already talked about. It's it's all networking. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, yep. it's all networking. There's no speaker or topic, and I think that lends itself really well to everything that you're already doing with your mindset and and putting yourself out there. Because when you're hosting that type of a meetup, you really have to work to get people to connect. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's surprising, actually. One thing I've definitely noticed is that if you're, if you're into real estate, if you're either a real estate investor or you're into real estate investing, getting people to talk to each other is really not that hard. We, uh, we all want to talk about what we have going on. I mean, there's always a few people that are brand new to it and, and are hesitant. And I'm really, yes. And first of all, to back up, yes, my, my meetings are 100% networking. That's it. I basically, this is where I'm going to be. This is where the, this is, you know, what time and this is what day. Come on out and hang out. I mean, there is no agenda whatsoever other than I'm going to be there. And people just show up and I tell them, it's like, you're going to get out of this what you put into it. It's like anything else, right? You can, yep. you can go to any seminar, any training, anything else. They're going to give you the information. If you choose to do something with it, then great. If you don't, then you're not going to get anything out of it. So I tell people, you'll get out of it what you put into it. I mean, you know. I could have you guys with several hundred units come to my meetup. Abraham comes to my units. He's got hundreds of mobile home park pads. I've got people doing lease options, single family, multifamily. And I've got people that are just have read a book and they're just interested and they start talking to each other. Um, but yeah, a hundred percent pure networking, no speaker, no agenda. There, heck, there's people that come to my meetup that I don't, that don't, they probably don't even know that I'm the host and know who I am because they just show up and all these people are just talking. They just come in and start talking to whoever. And, uh, and it just, it's organic. And I get, 
pre-COVID, I was getting 30, 35 people per meetup coming. So yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a great number. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, and I had last month, we had right at around 20, which was the first one outside of COVID. Um, you know, the day we're recording this is actually my meetup is tonight. Um, of, and I'm expecting a pretty big crowd. The only thing I do is I do, I post it on Facebook and I post it on Bigger Pockets, and I do boost the post on Facebook. I spend about 25 bucks to try to get it out there. And there's no doubt that that has made a difference because even the people who know about it, by boosting it, it pops up on their Facebook feed. Right, it makes it, yeah, you know? relevant. Because as of. you guys said, there's like a billion people on Facebook, you know, yeah, right? So, right. I mean, you're gonna get people that are gonna see that. And uh, yeah. so it's, I'm expecting a pretty big crowd tonight. And you know, it, you're providing a service like just by being consistent with the date and the time and showing up. So, I mean, for other people that might be thinking about like, Oh, how can I, what can I do to get involved? A meetup is a great way because you've proven the model that you don't have to have a presentation every time. You don't have to have a speaker presenting every time. You don't necessarily have to have some kind of content, if you can just consistently provide a space where people can gather and, and cause so much of this business is just exposure, you know, cause you've said the quote that I like so much is, you know, you can't go to a seminar to learn how to ride a bike. You know, eventually you, you have to get on the bike and that's a lot like this business. You can listen to podcasts, you can do reading, but eventually, you know, you have to actually see how a real deal works and talk to real people and get the details of the ins and outs of things. And that's where a lot of the stuff at meetups happens. It's like, cause we're sharers largely. I mean, you know, like, yeah, this is what I'm going through. And here's the, here's the, you know, the kind of gray area of, of this part of the business that you, 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 you know, you can't really get out of, you know, one chapter on, operating expenses or something from an underwriting book. So, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, kind of going back to how you've, you've grown in a short time and are still doing W2, but you didn't have to like reinvent the wheel in order to provide this huge amount of exposure for yourself and, and others with the meetup. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was really just that in general. I mean, just like I said, I have to, I have to, whenever I go to someplace new, because I have to move it around from venue to venue just because of limitations. But whenever I go to a new venue, I, I warn the wait staff. It's like, look, this is not a formal dinner. So don't expect everybody to sit down and then like you're going to go around the table and order. These are real estate investors. If you leave us alone, we will talk to each other all night long and never order anything. We will die of starvation <laughs> and thirst without even realizing it because we're too busy talking about what we have going on, not just bragging the good, the bad. There's one thing I've noticed about real estate investors is we are, we have, we are very humble. We got no problem sharing every problem we got going on. I mean, which is fits my personality really good. Cause I got this problem where sometimes I don't know when to shut up. So I sometimes share a little bit too much information and being around other real estate investors, I realize I'm not alone in that because yeah. we're not afraid to just throw it out there. And being generous with our experiences, I think, is part of it as well. You know, that whole, hey, yeah. I did this. Do you want to, you know, avoiding this or this? The pie is big enough type help. thing. Absolutely. And I think that goes back to the mindset bit. Mm -hmm. And personal growth. Like for me, you know, you know, Darren's a very comfortable talking in front of people and networking. Uh, and that was something that I lacked. I'm much better at it now. It's... Um, I'm comfortable with it, but I don't think it's really something that is part of my personality. It's actually something that I work on where, you know, where Darren, it's, that's just his personality. That's what you're going to get. And actually, Derek, you come off the same way. You say introvert, but I think when you're, when you're on the right subject, you're, uh, that goes away to some extent, but uh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's a personal growth thing too. You know, you're like, Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm growing as a human by getting out of my comfort zone here. Well, and when I'm in, when I'm in small groups talking to a couple people, I'm comfortable. When I'm standing up in front of a bigger audience, it's, it's work. Um, and, and, and the relationship and the networking side, I, I tend to lean more towards the analytical side but I'm not super analytical. I can't sit down just in front of a spreadsheet all day long, but my brain tends to function more better on that side. So I know I have to get myself out there more, but when I do, when I have to get out there and be that, 
you know, that salesman, that projection when I, that's work for me. Um, so like even at my W2 job, there's days when I have to be that frontline sales guy. And there's days when I'm sitting in the office, just, you know, running analysis and looking at data. And there's no doubt that those days that I'm outside and having to be that customer service rep and that that's a lot of effort for me. When I go home after nights of that, I am just mentally drained. I can do it. I like uh, Gino uses that term omnivert and, and I, that's me. I, I'm, I much more prefer to just be alone and work by myself. But when I, when I need to be that other person, when I need to put myself out there, I can do it. I can turn it on and I can do it, but it's work. So when I'm done, mm -hmm. I'm exhausted. Um, so that's, that's the challenge. That's why, I, and as I start to build, I know as I start to build a team around me, I need somebody that's got that, what Darren has, you know, that, that natural ability to just talk to people and just, I'm not good at, 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 you know, getting inside, you know, I don't want to say getting inside their head. That's not a good way to put it, but really just understanding that other person. I'm not good at that. My mind tends to go to, okay, here's what the numbers are and this makes sense. So let's just do this. You know, why we need to, right, yeah. why we need to confuse it and convolute it with all this other minutia. Let's just, let's just do it. It, it makes sense. Look at the numbers. Um, and at the same That's token, familiar. I'm a, I'm a ready aim. I'm a ready shoot aim kind of guy too. So I'm the type of person that wants to just get in there and do it and then figure it out. Um, so I'm dangerous. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, that's maybe you'll agree with me on this. You know, on the education side, I like to get to the point where I educate and I educate till I start hearing things repeat themselves, and then I'm like, oh, okay, I think I've got you know the baseline working now. Now it now it's time to execute because I you know you. I'm like, am I getting much more out of continuing this education? Now the real education has to start when you actually just start operating. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, and, and you're right. I mean, I don't listen to a ton of real estate books anymore because it, there's only so much they can say, you know, it's, it, it's all the same information. You're hearing it over and over again. And even with mindset books, you're listening to the same thing over and over again. Sometimes it's just the way one particular author, or maybe even the person, you know, actually uh you know reading doing the audio for the book maybe it's just the way they present it that really helps to click for you that's why you know that's why i do encourage continue to listen to continue to read because it just might be the way the message is presented by one particular person that may finally be what it takes even though it's the same exact message I, again customer service wise in my full-time job i get this all the time so, you know, one of, the, one of the guys on the team will say something to a customer and the customer's all upset and I'll come out or somebody else come out and say basically the exact same thing and the customer is perfectly fine. And, and the other person will be upset. It's like, that's exactly what I told them. And it's like, it's, but it's in the delivery. It's in the way you said it. It's in the, the spirit of what you said it. It's, a, it's, it's about empathy. It's about understanding where they're at. Yes, it was the same information, but it was presented differently. And he related to, what, to the way I said it. It didn't relate to the way you said it. So that works on our side as well when I'm listening to these books and finding somebody that says something that just resonates with me. That's good. Yeah, because you just, it's an interruption. And that is coming from somebody else perceives that it's a change. But your delivery contains the same subject matter. It just uh, switches it up for whoever is listening and they are hearing the same information in a new way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and yeah. again, that's how it, you know, that's what can make all the difference. And, you know, and, and, and I've, I've done a little bit of everything in, in my, in my W2. And I mean, I have, we haven't talked about it. I'm, I'm the service director for a group of Harley Davidson dealerships. I, I didn't, I didn't go to college. I, I, I went out of high school. I went to a technical school. I became a technician. I liked taking stuff apart. I was, I liked fixing things and taking stuff apart and seeing how they worked. You know, in hindsight, if I was going to go to college, I probably should have gone and been an engineer or something like that. Cause I just love taking stuff apart and seeing how things function. But I went down more of a, more of a fun organic side of things in working on motorcycles. So I, uh, but as I grew from that, I, as I grew from a technician and, and I, was, I was just always a bit of a leader in the shop, that grew into management and that grew into higher director positions to what started out as a passion for working on motorcycles and taking stuff apart turned into being a manager over 50 employees in four locations and, you know, two states. And, you know, that's not the same kind of thing that I started doing. But um, 
you know, obviously it's a lot more lucrative than, than just mm-hmm. fixing motorcycles for a living. But at the same token, you know, the money you can make in real estate doing so much less work to help make somebody else a lot of money. It was just kind of like, man, I feel like I've just been running down this rabbit hole for all these years. And it's, you can uh, still work on motorcycles. And, and if yeah, I want to, and, it, and if, and yeah, and, and I <laughs> hope to get back to that point. Cause that was the part that I really enjoyed, but you know, right. the, yeah. I've been out of I've been out of being a technician for 15 years now. So even still now, when I get into it, I'm like, I don't, I don't even know that I enjoy doing that anymore. I enjoy doing it as a when it's just for fun. But even then, I get bored with it sometimes. Now I'm looking. Well, I, I wrote down early, like when you talked about the W two stuff, like in the reference of riding, it's like you know having to work five days a week, working for the weekend, hoping the weather is good enough to ride. Well, and, here's and I'm the other sure side you want to be in the position is like, today's yeah. a good day to go for a ride. I, I can I can analyze oh, well, these properties yeah. tonight after dinner or yeah. something like when it's dark or when yeah. it's raining. Or, well, and here's the other side of that too. That's the other downside. People get into the motorcycle industry because they like riding, they like motorcycles, and they realize that when everybody else is riding, that's when you have to be at work. Work. And it's a seasonal business. So sure. during the summer months, I mean, my the guys that work for me, are working 55 to 60 hours a week all summer long. They don't, they don't get to get out and enjoy riding near right. as much, you know, when they do have a day off, they're usually pretty tired. They've got stuff to do around the house. So it's like anything else. What starts out as a passion, it starts out as something fun. You get in there and realize it's still a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it can really deflate a lot of people. And, and, and some people just thrive on it. I'm, I'm a workaholic. I've been a workaholic my whole life. I can't help, but if I'm not staying busy 55 to 60 hours a week, at least I don't feel like I'm being productive, um, which is part of why I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing now. I mean, I've in the leadership role at the dealerships that I'm at, you know, I can put in 35 to 40 hours a week. I've got people that keep these stores running and, and I don't have to be hands on very much, but I'm doing that. Plus I'm working real estate, you know, every moment that I'm not working for the dealership. I mean, I'm, I'm constantly responding to clients. Yeah. That's one of, that's one of my questions is like, how do you okay. do that? I mean, are you, you know, do you sleep? time blocking is a strategy. I mean, there's things like that. Do you, do you have systems? Do you use apps? I mean, have you developed something or is it still, and, and there's no shame in this, you know, cause you're obviously having some success or you're still just kind of chasing it around a little bit. I'm chasing it. I mean, okay. I, I, I know, <laughs> I know what, I know there's certain days of the week that I have to be at my W2 job. Now, I, I, again, being in the role I'm in there, I do have a lot of flexibility. Uh, I mean, there's certain things that I have to get done. There's certain days I have to be there. I, I have to put in 35 to 40 hours a week. But with all the different locations we have, I travel some for the dealership. So in between everything, um, I'm, I'm working with clients real estate wise to, to, you know, a lot of what I'm working with is a lot of out of state clients anyway. So not a lot of them are here. So it's not like a typical residential real estate agent where I'm showing houses to one at a time to, to folks here and there. I'm working, um, I'm working with a team um, that is head up by Avery Carl called the short-term shop. Basically, I was ask you about that. Yeah, it yeah. is 100% short-term rentals. That's what we do. And I've got a few other local clients and I've got a few other people. I'll do other transactions for other people. But I've known Avery for about four or five years. When I started this story, I talked about the friends that were trying to get me into real estate. It was Avery and her, and her husband, Luke, that, that got me onto this mindset to start with. And now she's one of the top agents in the country. Um, she's heading up the number one team in the Smoky Mountains. And she just decided to concentrate on short-term rentals. There was tons of real estate. I mean, in Knoxville, for an example, in the Knoxville Association of Realtors, there are roughly a little over 5,500 licensed agents. There are only like 3,500 to 4,000 houses on the market right now. So, I mean, it, it, the numbers don't make sense. So how do you differentiate yourself? And she just decided she was doing well with the with cabins. And she said, I'm going to focus on this. So she went all in on that. And now she's doing phenomenal. So now she started to build this team of agents and I was supposed to come on with her about a year ago when she was first really starting her team. Before that, she was just independent, working with all these clients herself. And I, again, those limiting beliefs, that mindset kicked in. Ah, I don't know if I'm ready to leave my W-2. I don't know if I'm going to make this commitment. How am I going to make enough money? You know, fear and all those things kicked in again. And I switched brokerages to work for the same broker that she was with. 
but I didn't actually join her team. We kind of mutually decided that it wasn't the right time. Now, we say, I say we mutually decided it was my fault. I should have pushed her, but my brain said, no, you're not ready for this. Well, about the first of this year, I, she had at that point had two full-time agents and another part-time agent working underneath her. I could see, I look at closed listings every day. I saw how many cabins they were selling. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I called her up uh, in the begin in March, the early March. And, uh, and she lived about two hours, two and a half, three hours from me at that point. And I said, um, what are you doing Friday morning? Are you free? She said, yeah. I said, are you going to be out in the Smokies? You're going to be at home? She said, oh, I'm going to be at home. I said, I'm going to come out and see you. And she said, uh, okay. So I drove two and a half hours to meet her at Starbucks to look her in the eye and say, I'm coming to work for you. And she said, okay. And she's like, you know, you didn't have to drive all the way out here to, to have this conversation. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I know, but I, I thought it was the right thing to do. So I, I immediately joined her team at the beginning of March. And um, immediately, I mean, I went from, again, full-time job. So I, how, do you, how do you build a real estate business as an agent, right? You got to market, you got to get out there. You got to, it's hard to do. There's a lot of competition. What have you got to offer? You know, I, I just got my license a year ago. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm new to real estate, but I'm not new to life, you know, kind of, but it's like, that doesn't do any good. You know, people work with people they know, like, and trust. Sure. Well, my sphere of influence, the people I knew were all people at the Harley dealership. Well, that's who I sold a couple of houses to, but it's not a big audience to, to pick from. Anyway, I go to work with her and the first weekend I'm working with her, she, she feeds me seven leads. And all of a sudden I've got clients like I don't know what to do with. Well, then of course COVID hit and everything kind of stopped. So I was like, here we go. It's my timing again, right? So your mindset starts going, see, I knew I shouldn't have done this. The timing was horrible. Now there's no business. But I was, I said, no, it's going to be fine. And I pushed through and from October of 18 to, um, through March, I had through March of this year, so a year and a half, I had closed on four total real estate transactions as an agent. Two of them were properties I bought for myself. So I had two, two clients that I worked with. Since March, since I joined her team, I have closed six. Um, I think six might include the one that I bought for myself. I've got, I had another closing yesterday. I've got four close, five closings next week and three more scheduled for the end of the month. Holy cow. So, wow. I mean, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> big time ramped up. Just, just being around the right people and even just joining her team. I didn't know anything more because I joined her team. I've known her for years. I already knew all the knowledge and information, but I started, I started getting more business organically because I had confidence now just because I was on her team. And it was right. amazing. That's like the five people you surround with. Yeah, it was amazing yeah. how, how easy it felt. But now, again, so yes, I'm, I'm spread thin right now. I mean, I, like today is a vacation. I took a vacation day from my W-2 because I've got this to do this morning and I've got several clients to catch up on. I've got to go meet a client in Pigeon Forge for an inspection. So I'm, I'm working my vacation time in mm -hmm. to balance the real estate. And in a few months... I'll be in a position where I won't need that W-2 job anymore from a financial standpoint. And at that point, then it becomes time to, you know, shit or get off the pot, as they say, you yeah. know, it's time to, time to make a move either, either I'm a serious full-time real estate investor and agent or I'm not. Um, so I'm really close to that point because I, I realize I need to get out there and do it more. Um, Cause that's the only way I'm going to, it's the only way I'm going to continue to progress. Right. Like business strategy wise, going back, you know, you, a lot of people have the same problem. We had the same problem. Didn't have a lot of capital to work with. Um, so was the real estate and then the flipping, was that done purposefully for the large injections of capital? Yes. So, yes. So and yeah, absolutely. Kind of get um, that ball rolling on having something to work with. Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my finances started similar to a lot of people. Um, I refinanced my primary residence because I had equity in it. I had lived in okay. it for 14 yep. years. Appreciation was incredible. So I refinanced it. That gave me an influx of cash. Then I found a private lender to fund that first deal. And he funded, again, the purchase and the initial rehab. But I had, I had cash now from my refinance 
because I knew I would go over budget. It helped I mean, your was, balance sheet. Yeah, it, it yeah. helped me feel safe that I knew I could go into this. And then that deal worked out perfect where I got all that money back. And then I bought this primary residence. So I took that house that I had refinanced, which I had quite a bit of debt on at this point, but I was able to find a renter in there for, well, I'll, I'll share the numbers. So I refinanced the house. I took out almost 102000 or almost $200,000 uh, on my refinance. So I had a, wow. a pretty decent mortgage on it. So when I decided I was going to rent that thing and I'm talking to all these other landlords and I'm telling them where it is and this and that, and they're like, man, you're going to have a hard time cash flowing on that thing. I said, I'm going to rent that thing for $2,000 to $2,100 a month. And they all told me I was crazy. And I put it on Facebook and I got very little response but I'm getting $2,100 a month for that rental. You only need one response. Yeah, right. you only need one response. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, like that refi thing, we did the same thing. And, and that's a huge mindset with home ownership is taking that refi money because they're like trying to get your mind so that you're – it's just a transfer of equity to another property. You're you're not taking that money. You're you know you didn't buy a hot tub and a new Harley, and go to Tahiti or buy depreciating assets or just you know whatever. You just took that money and transferred it to another vehicle, which is now cash flowing for yep. you. I Big mean time. that that was that was that was the snowball. Yep. Of sorts. So Taking that, I was able to buy this. Again, I'm a, I'm a real estate agent, so that helps. So when I bought this house, um, it was it's a little itty bitty house. It was built in 1939, I think, but it was well taken care of. It had been a long term rental since the early 90s. Same guys had owned it. They took good care of it. It was in good shape. So they had this house listed for eighty nine thousand dollars, and I said, well, you know, I don't want to have to put a lot of cash out. So I worked with the sellers and the seller's agent, and I actually offered them 98.5 for the house, but with them paying all of my closing costs up to 6%, and they paid the list agent an 8% commission instead of the usual six, which he split with me, 4% each. So oh, wow. okay. I buy a house for just under $100,000. I put 10% down but I only took about $6,300 out of my pocket to get into this house. So the only thing you had to worry about was the appraisal then. It had to appraise at the it right amount. It had to appraise, which, yeah. it, it, which wasn't city, a problem, obviously. Which was not a problem. And this, first of all, you know, houses tend to appraise at what they're for sale for, unless it's Isn't really, that weird how really, that happens? yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it is. And I've had conversations, and I actually, I met a uh, appraiser at a, uh, at a meetup once, and I had a conversation with him, and, he's, and his, his comment to me was, well, Assuming it's an arm's length transaction, there's not something in, inside going on. If that's what you're willing to pay for the house, that sets you, the market. Aren't you pretty much setting the market price? Yeah. And I said, well, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So he said, so as long as the market can justify it, mm -hmm. then it's fine. I mean, you can, selling these short term rental cabins, you know, here's the reality of this people are freaking out on these prices of these cabins. In the last three years, the market in Sevier County for these cabins has appreciated by almost 100%. Literally, oh, cabins really? that sold for $150,000 to $180,000 three years ago will now sell for three three fifty. dollars I mean, it makes no sense. The reason being is because people have started to realize how much cash flow there is using it as a short-term rental if you're self-managing. So these appraisers come in, and if all they looked at is data over the last couple of years – they would never appraise, but you know, in the last couple of months, yeah, they'll appraise, and they always seem to appraise right at or really close to value. Um, yeah, we were, we were at lunch yesterday in Chattanooga with some people from out of state, and short-term rentals came up, and you know, verified Darren's uh, fact, or he said, Sevier County is the highest-grossing short-term rental yep. market in the U.S. Yep. I assume it was in the U.S. That's what he said. That's what he said. Yeah. Even yeah, if it's it in the top five, that's oh, it is. impressive. Yeah. In the U.S., it is number one. And the reality is it has been for a couple of years, but it's kind of off the grid. It's not, it doesn't get as much media as, as Colorado and California and some of these other markets do. But it's, it's such a secure market. They've been doing overnight rentals 
in Sevier County since the 70s, since before the mm. word short-term rental existed. They were, they were just cabin rentals, you know? I mean, right. ask anybody from the Southeast and they know somebody, or at least who knows somebody who took a vacation and stayed at a cabin in Gatlinburg or Pigeon Forge at some point in their childhood. I mean, they've been doing this forever. Right. So the market here. just got more efficient with technology then or something. Big time. I okay. mean, Airbnb was huge. But even three years ago, when Airbnb first was getting popularity in the area, it was still a bit labor intensive for a person to manage their property and to set their pricing. Well, in the last few years, there's software companies that have gotten smart and have capitalized on this. I mean, my cabin, I spend maybe 30 minutes a week managing my cabin. And it spits out about twelve to fifteen hundred dollars a month in cash flow. I mean, ridiculous, ridiculous numbers, um, because I have software that automates it all. I have software that sets my pricing for me. All I have to do is put in some baselines, and it adjusts my price from day to day to try to maximize the rate I can get for it. I have software that, when somebody books, it automatically sends them messages. It sends them information. I occasionally have to respond to somebody and I have to make sure that my, uh, the, the person who cleans the cabin for me knows what the schedule is. And that's it. That's all I have to do. What are those softwares? Cause I mean, you know, we have another partner that was, I mentioned he was, you know, he uses air DNA. Mm -hmm. He's, he started showing me some of the data that they spit out yeah. for these short-term rentals. And it is granular. I mean, yeah. I was like, Holy crap. I wish they had this for, you know, uh, and maybe it does exist for multifamily, but it's at, uh, you know, at an institutional mm -hmm. level or something, but right. Yeah. yeah you, there's, you, can, um, you can really dive down into, you know, figuring out what particular kind of property is correct for your market, you know, whether it's a, a studio apartment or a three bedroom, two bath house, right. you know, well, and that's just it for us. And that's why the Smoky Mounds are so easy because you don't have to deal, dig that deep into the analytics. I mean, we could share the data to say that a one, a one bedroom cabin will do on average thirty-five dollars to $40,000 a year, period. A two bedroom will do forty-five dollars to $50,000 a year on average. That's, that's gross. That's top line before any expenses, before your mortgage for anything. So you got to work back from there. We know what these will do as an average, a typical run of the mill, nothing really special about it. Now, if you find one that has a really nice view, if you take really good care of it and you put some a little bit higher end in it so that you get good reviews, so people are coming back and wanting to see it, and you push yourself up above that average. My cabin is 600 square feet. It is a one bedroom cabin. It's isolated. It's promoted as a honeymoon type cabin. And I advertise it as being cozy and private but close to Pigeon Forge. And I have had, I closed on this thing on May 19th. I had my first guest check in on May 22nd. I actually had my listing live before I closed on it and was taking reservations before I owned it. I closed on it. I went in and spent three days doing some updates and some upgrades on it. it, it I had my first guest check in on the 22nd. Since the 22nd of May, I have had two vacant nights. Wow. I Holy have, crap. I have, or, I have, this grossed, is in the middle of the pandemic and the, this is during the pandemic. Yep. Yeah. I have grossed roughly $10,000, almost $11,000 after my last payout in, in less than 10 weeks, I've pulled in about 10 grand in revenue out of this cabin. I put a total, now I got a smoking deal on this cabin. So let me just say that. Um, but I've been looking for a year, working every angle I could and finally found one on the MLS that I just landed on perfectly. But uh, I only put out about 20 grand of my own money to have this cabin purchased and, and fixed up to the where I wanted it. So I've already got half of that back. Wow, you know? nice. So yeah, this cabin yes. it will be on pace in a full year to do $50,000 a year. And it's a one bedroom cabin. Yeah, and obviously you've got some equity in it. Yeah. Because oh, you I had could, a great deal on it. So you're, I could, you're, you I have could multiple exits on the market. Already. Yeah, yeah, I could put this thing on the market tomorrow and probably sell it for 200 to 25. Easy. I paid 145 for it mm. two months ago. Yeah. But I don't, there's no reason for me to sell it when I can make that money. I'm going to make that yeah, money right. back you in make that money anyway. 10 times. Yeah. yeah. In, sure. uh, over the next few years. And it doesn't sound like you're spending a lot of time on it. No. And to answer your question about softwares, uh, pricing softwares, there's two big ones out there um, uh, Beyond Pricing and Price Labs. 
And then management softwares, there's a half a dozen or so out there yeah. that you can use that'll help to, to, to manage it. And that's, you know, one of the benefits of working with the short-term shop and Avery Carl's team is, you know, first and foremost, everybody knows in real estate as a buyer, you don't pay your agent anything, you know, not unless it's a for sale by owner and the for sale by owner won't pay the agent. But basically the, the seller pays the list agent, the list agent pays the buyer's agent. So if I'm representing you or anybody on my team is representing you as a buyer for a cabin, you don't, we don't actually cost you anything, nothing. So not only do we help you find the cabin, find a good cabin for you, but once you're under contract and beyond inspection and we know you're gonna close, one of the benefits we give is we have a short-term shop university where we have a guy on our team that does a weekly webinar that shows you how to manage it, how to do what yeah. software is to use, oh, right on. feeds you tons of Very information, nice. connections on, on cleaners, on handyman, on furniture, where you can get all this stuff, just this huge list and all this information he'll share with you if you're going to work with us and then hopefully you're going to realize that you're going to make a bunch of cash and you come back with work with work with us right. again. So we're making our money. And, yeah, we're making our money through the seller. And you're going to get I mean, a repeat customer. Yeah. I mean, it's yep. really, it, it costs the buyer nothing to work with us, literally nothing to work with us because right. nothing comes out of their pocket and we're going to, if they follow it, it's like anything else. If you, if you go to the, to the seminars and you go to the, and you get the booklet and you actually follow it, it's proven it works. If you work with us and you actually listen to us and actually follow the systems, it's proven and it'll work. You're going to make tons of money. All you got to do is work backwards. It's the I execution know this cabin, side of it. Yeah. yeah. I know the cabin can make $60,000 a year because the data tells me that it can make $60,000 a year. So now I'm going to work backwards like anything else. Right. You're going to figure out your NOI, figure out what your cash flow is and decide what cash flow am I comfortable with. Well, the reality is a poor performing cabin is going to cash flow four or five hundred dollars a month, which is better than what most anybody's doing on single family or, you mm -hmm. know, per door on multifamily. Obviously, the benefit of multifamily mm -hmm. is you've got 100, 200 doors. So even if they're only cash flowing one, two hundred dollars a month, it's one transaction. But 100 doors at 100 dollars a month, that's a pretty good cash flow. It's one deal. Mm -hmm. um, but you can take a, a cabin and cash flow a thousand to fifteen hundred. So if you're. It, you know, if you're not in that position, you can't afford to get into something big like multifamily. You don't have the connections yet. You don't have the right people. You don't have the cash to, you're not an accredited investor. You don't have the cash to be a limited partner. You can buy one of these things with 10% down as a vacation home, get right now 3% interest rates. I mean, that's the other side of it. The interest rates make a $300,000 cabin that you could have bought a year ago for $200,000, but your payments are not that much different because- a year ago, your interest rate was four, four and a half percent, and now your interest rate's three percent. So, are those fully amortized for thirty? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If you're buying it that way, you can buy them just as a regular investment property, which is usually fifteen percent down. But uh, the real, the real, the real benefit is everybody, anybody can buy as long as you qualify, you know, debt to income wise, conventional mortgage for a vacation home, as long as it's not. You know, there's there's some restrictions on vacation homes, but you live in Johnson City, you could buy a cabin in the Smoky Mountains as a vacation home. You only have to put 10% down and you get the same benefits as if it was a primary. You get the same kind of rates that you would qualify for in a primary residence as you do on it. The only difference is you don't, there's no rental income until you've been renting it for two years. It's, they treat it just like 1099 income. So your your income from your W-2 or whatever it is has to be there to cover oh, okay. the mortgage gotcha. payment, which is, you know, the one downside. Got it. And you've got to have the cash, you know, to close, obviously. Yeah, but we got started in like turnkey single family rentals in mm -hmm. Memphis. And, you know, they kicked off a couple hundred bucks. And I was like, man, we're going to need like 40 of these yeah. before <laughs> anything really starts to happen. So in terms of the the amount of property that you have to hold to reach similar returns goals, you know, you might have to have 10. Yeah. Well, you and know. that's just it. I don't have. And that keeps, that keeps your acquisition costs down, yeah. all this stuff associated with closing. And, and, you know, you're talking 10, 15% down, you know, we had to do 20 down on. Right. Their, you so, know, residential stuff. So. Yeah. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm an independent kind of guy. I know we, you have to work with teams and you have to work with people. That's how you expand. But I have very modest 
aspirations and goals for my real estate. I mean, yeah, I that's wanna... one of the questions. Like, what, what's what's the next year or, or five years or whatever your time horizon? What are you what are you looking to accomplish? I, I'm, I'm looking for pure freedom. I want to have about a dozen or so total properties split between long term and short term rentals, just to kind of have some balance there, to where I'm spitting out enough cash flow to live a very modest lifestyle but to give me the freedom to go do what I want to do when I want to do it. If I want to get up and go ride my Harley, you know, for th the next three days, I just get up and go do it. Um, I, I have uh, very big aspirations of doing a lot of travel, um, which was another big, uh, big thing for me. I've always been fascinated with world history and just the world we live in. I mean, I, I've only lived in a few places. I've traveled a little bit, but there's just so much out there to see. So I, I want to travel um, is ultimately what I want to do. I want to have enough cash flow coming in to sustain that lifestyle, which, you know, if I have seven or $8,000 in passive cash flow, all my bills are paid, I can, I can travel quite a bit and, and live pretty comfortably because yeah. when I'm, if I'm traveling, I don't need a house here. I don't need a car here. So I, could, I can sell or rent all that stuff out while I'm out traveling. Um, you can go and, and live in many other parts of the world for a lot cheaper than you can live here. So I can move around and just, I mean, Wait, there's cheaper places. Oh, the world. Bigger. I was like, that's why we're here. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. Holy cow. you know, Alaska was not a, wasn't California expensive, but it was up there a little bit. Oh yeah. So, you know? Yeah. But get out, go to, go to, go to, over to Europe, go to yeah, Asia. I mean, right. My God, yeah. it's. And so, yeah, I just, I want to try, I want to be a nomad. I mean, I want to go from this guy that's doing a bunch of stuff right now. And then once I get my stuff done, I'm going to, I'll disappear. Uh, you know, probably I'll start doing a video blog as I'm, as I'm traveling across the world. Yeah. You know? I want I mean, to see the video blog from you. Yeah. I mean, be a TikTok I, star. Yeah. I like, oh. I like, I like to run. So I'll run in a different city and I'll do a different video, you know, every couple of days where I finished a run in some other city. I mean, part of that was, uh, 2018, when my daughter was a senior in high school, we went on a, a trip with the, with the school where we went and spent um, a 10 day trip, eight days across Northern Italy and into France. And that was, again, one of the re one of those things that was just an absolute catalyst for me to say, it was just incredible. I mean, just to be around the history. I mean, I, I was in Florence, Italy, you know, staring at a replica because it's not the original of the statue of David. And I'm standing in the same, in the same square that leonardo da vinci and michelangelo stood and it's to me that was just like i, I want to be able to just go live there for a while and just enjoy that that culture it was such yeah, a because you can culture. read world history but like you're saying you can go basically experience it you, you know yeah. you can like yep. you know you'd be like oh okay you know somebody else that i admire in history for one reason or another stood in this square mm-hmm and now I am too. So it's a, yeah, it's a great way to connect with stuff that you like. Yeah. So uh, that's my end game. Yeah. If I can get about five or six cabins and a few long-term rentals. And, and that's and, totally doable. I mean, you're, oh yeah. you're basically, you're halfway there. I mean, you're, yeah. 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 And then, and then, and then turn and that you're three all years over in. To, you're not turn even that all over in. to property management when I'm at that point. So I don't have to even manage it from afar and, you know, just keep tabs as I go in and enjoy my life and have my freedom. All right, so there's somebody listening, hopefully. More specifically, there's somebody <laughs> one, one or two people, One or two people are listening that, that don't already know. Uh, you know, so that they're you in 2017. So it's, it's yeah. kind of like that question. What would you tell yourself now that when you were still trying to figure out exactly what's going on in 2017 to, to maybe do faster, quicker, better, or, or just get started is a, is a very common answer. And actually, you know, I think it's a very valid answer. Um, I think it, it's got to start with, you got to evaluate where you're at in life. You know, you got to take a really, really deep, hard look at where you're at, what's going on around you. Um, and, and you know what what obligations you have i mean we all control our lives we get to control what we do but i'm a big believer in if you've had if you've got an obligation to somebody you keep that obligation i don't care what it takes so you got to look at what's going on around if you've got a couple of young kids and you've got a wife and you're the only income earner then you got to decide you know do i keep my w2 job i i, I talk to people at some of the meetups that that they talk about wanting to get into real estate investing and they have credit card debt and all this other stuff. And I'm like, man, you need to get that 
Yeah, you need to get, you get your house in order first. a little bit. Yeah. So I mean, so I I don't. There's no one solid answer to that because every person's situation is different. You know, the best advice I can give on anything like that is. You don't control what's happening around you, but you get to control how you deal with it and how you react to it. So whatever it is, control your actions. You know, I want to do this. Okay, well, then don't go out and buy that new car. Don't go out and buy, you know, $300 in groceries. Start looking at where you can save money. It's got to start. It's got to start there. I mean, I, I was fortunate in that I was never a big spender. We, we spent money, we enjoyed our lives. I didn't have a savings, but I had a good sense about it. So when I got serious, I got serious. I mean, it, and you know, if you wanna make things happen the way I did, or the, even the way, I mean, lots of people have progressed a lot faster than me in other ways, but they all had the same thing in common. They ditched everything else and they got serious. I mean, and that, you take that for what it's worth. I'm not saying you turn your life upside down and, you know, destroy your family or whatever else you've got going on, but you have to make a conscious decision on what I want to do and set a plan. Um, I was in my forties and I decided that I wanted my plan to be a little bit more accelerated. So I literally turned my entire life upside down to, to project myself as quickly forward as I possibly could. Yeah. I mean, we're similar that way. And, and, Full disclosure, it's not easy. No. And sometimes it's very uncomfortable. I mean, we moved our family, you know, across the, the United States. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's, you, 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 some tough decisions are will have to be made and will continue to be made, but they're, they're in pursuit of growth. You know, right. So, um, you know. Well, in one aspect, one of the things I went through um, I don't, I don't share it a lot because it can, it can be looked on very negatively, but I know there's probably people out there that are going through it. So I don't mind, you know, for that purpose, sharing it is one of the things that I decided I needed to do in my life to get myself to where I was at was I needed to get a divorce. I mean, I, I, I literally took a 20 year marriage that I didn't feel was in any way, shape or form beneficial to anybody, not to myself, not to my wife, not to my daughter it was not a great thing to be in. And, and I knew that if I was going to go down this path, I needed to make some serious life changes. And you want to talk about a serious life change. I mean, I basically yeah. made a decision to leave my wife after 20 years to go down this path. And that can sound very horrible and very negative. But the reality is it was something that probably needed to happen well before any of this and, and, and stayed into it for all the wrong reasons. And, um, and like you said, I mean, that, that can be viewed on very negatively by a lot of people. But the reality is I know there's people out there that are probably in that situation. So, I mean, you mm -hmm. know, I don't care for anybody to reach out and have that conversation because that was – even though it was something I decided and that I felt was best for me, it was still the most miserable thing I ever had to go through in my life, you know, to, to, to know how that's affecting other people around me. But at, you, at some point, you have to do what you think is right for everybody involved not just for yourself because it was the right thing for everybody involved whether the, whether other people saw it that way or not it was the best thing for everybody wow i mean thank you for sharing something so absolutely. personal that you. uh I, you're absolutely right with the preface that you know if you're going through something somebody else probably just went through it is about to go through it or mm -hmm. is currently in it right now so um yeah, appreciate you uh, being that transparent with your personal life. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's get everybody in touch with you, Derek. Uh, hopefully, to talk more about real estate than uh, the last subject we covered. But well, you know what? I look at it, 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 it for me. I mean, I don't have. I, I mean, the short term stuff I can definitely help with, but there's people out there that know more than me. Um, real estate wise, there's plenty of people out there that know more than me, um, but you know, mindset and, and everything else, you know, I, I'm more than happy to talk to anybody to try to help them, you know, I get think to you have a lot be. to offer as an agent and as an investor. I think you, you've done a lot of interesting things. And I think I, I think you have a lot to offer. In I appreciate it. Yeah, especially very specific to the short term rental, because yeah. that that is, uh, that is a model in and of itself. There's a lot of details that go along with that, because of 
the unit turns and everything like that. So yeah. if you know that you're well, working a, with a group that has all it. of that under one umbrella is a, is a huge win for anybody. Interested that's the key. I've got that. a team. Yeah. I've got a team of people I work with that help to make that easy. If I had to yeah, do it all there's, myself. I yeah. There, there's a lot to, there's a lot of coordination that goes on there. Yep. And yeah. And that, yeah, that market that you're in, I mean, I don't know if there's a more mature short-term rental market. Probably, yeah. And it's safe. They're not going to ever put rules in to prevent you from doing short-term rentals in Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg. That's the life. That's their, their economy. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Love it, so. That's their economy. So yeah, we'll drop your contact info uh, into the yeah. show notes. Uh, yeah. I always, always appreciate you talk to you. Probably should yeah. catch up to you more because uh, you know, just super authentic. And well, once I get off of that W two, and I got some more free time, I'll start yeah, well, Johnson City a little more often. You ride your bike down this way. Yeah. Well, and I'll, I'll say that there is another one. I'll throw that in too. Talk about sacrifices. I've been in this Harley business for twenty something years. And I've always owned a running motorcycle, and uh, I downsized a year or so ago to a smaller bike because I could. I was in a position where I had equity. I could own the bike outright. And then in January, I decided you know what, I really don't need this bike. So I sold my motorcycle and that the cash I got from selling that motorcycle was the money that I had to be able to put down payment on the cabin. So wow. for the yeah. first time in my life, I don't own a running motorcycle, but it's just because wow. I, you know what, I can sell that motorcycle. I can buy another motorcycle once I have a few more properties. I but, would also like to comment that you've been very clear that it's a running motorcycle. So I'm not going to ask how many I, unrunning I, motorcycles. I, I, I do technically <laughs> still own an un, a non-running motorcycle <laughs> that uh, started out as a project bike back in 1998. When I took it, it was a running motorcycle in 1998. I took it apart and, uh, and then I started buying new motorcycles and just never got around to putting it back together. So that's another one of my, uh, you know, retirement projects is someday I'll have free time to actually put that bike back together. So. It, I, and this is totally off target. Will it, will it always be Harley? Is there any chance for no, another brand? W2. He can't say I'm a, No, I'm a, I'm a Harley guy. I am. Okay. And, and that's not, I got no knock on and any other brand, anything right. else. There's lots there. of quality bikes yeah. out there. You just really like Harley. I'm a Harley it's guy. Fine. There's yeah. some old, old sayings in Harley. One of them is if I have to explain it, you wouldn't understand. I mean, uh -huh. I'm like, I'm What's like. What's the most... other one? Do you have a quart of oil? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's low. That's low. Um, I'm like most Harley guys. I've got it tattooed on my body. I'm a, I'm a Harley guy. I just, I, I love the, the, the history, the story that they're an American company. There's yeah, a lot of good right. benefits to it. And, yeah. and, you know, are they the absolute best motorcycle in the world? I guess that depends on what your definition of the best is. You know, what's nice about some of that stuff is like, you can walk, you can be in a parking lot, see somebody on a bike and immediately just potentially have a connection with yep. a complete stranger just sure. you know that kind of tribe thing is, is works out pretty cool sometimes you know that's why greg walks around with a frisbee wherever he goes that's why i walk around <laughs> with a frisbee so people don't talk to me do you do you wear it on your back so you kind of look like tron you remember tron from the 80s those were actually glow in the dark frisbees See? and they i think they were wearing i think they were wearing hockey gear i watched yeah. that on like a sunday afternoon movie like it's a great movie i was like wow and these were because it was they're like wow look at the special effects in this movie oh, yeah. tron and i'm like this is garbage it's like it's like watching people play laser tag but it was yeah. the 80s and it was it was, the 80s. It was cool for three weeks that was great you know <laughs> and then like cgi happened like two weeks later and you know they never did it again but yeah. All right, I'm going to ask one more question. Derek. Oh, okay. So said, is it about Tron? No, it's not about Tron. Okay, well, we'll so allow said, it. Rich, Rich Dad, Poor Dad set you on, on the path. What have, what have you most recently been, I know you don't read that you listen, so yeah, I, what most recently have you been listening to that you well, found? Well, I'll tell you, there's, there's a couple of books, and I, and I think, again, the book thing comes down to where you're at in your life and what you need. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple of key books for me um, a one book called The Big Leap by Gay Hedrick. That was a mindset book. It was a matter of getting your mind around, you know, what's preventing you from, from having success and moving forward. That one, I've listened to that book probably three times and uh, I, I come back to it every few months because that one really helps to refocus me on why I'm maybe not moving along as quickly as I should. It, it helps concentrate on self-sabotage and limiting beliefs and, you know, things of that nature. So that was a big one for me. Um, Extreme Ownership by Jocko Wilnick. Uh, 
again, phenomenal book about taking, taking responsibility and ownership for everything that happens in your life. Um, I got Brian Tracy, Eat That Frog, short, easy book, great one to, again, a mindset book to just get over it. And, and lastly, anything by Ryan Holiday. Um, I am a huge fan of Ryan Holiday. I don't agree with everything he talks about. But I listen to his daily podcast. I read the Daily Stoic every day and any of his books, Stillness is the Key, Obstacle is the Way. I, I own all the coins that he puts out. From a mindset perspective, I need that because I need to remind myself daily to, to – how I need to react because I still catch myself all the time going down the wrong path. So, um, yeah, he, he's the biggest one for me, but those other books were, were really critical at critical times for me. So it's hard to put down to one because where you're at in your Sorry. life, there's a book out yeah, there. Yeah. Right. You. I mean, there's books sure. that I've read that I got three years ago that I, that I've reread and, and gotten a completely different connection with them. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. This is Either well, I just wasn't journey. ready for I mean, it yet or however you want to. Yeah. Yeah. It's yep. a journey. Right. Exactly. So. All righty. Well, let's wrap it up. Um, we appreciate you joining us again yep. for the Real Wealth Solutions podcast. I am Greg Scully. Up and to the left on my screen. Kim, you want to you wanna take us out? All right. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Derek, for your time, your honesty, and we appreciate you very yeah. much. And no, good no luck problem. on your journey. All my, all my contact will be in the, in the notes. Share my cell yep. phone, my email address. I don't care. People can call or email me anytime. Absolutely. All right. All right. Thanks, Until Derek. next time. All right. See you guys. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye.